Chapter 30 Even late at night, the Drevstarn spaceport was a bustling hive of activity. The pedestrians and vehicles casting long shadows in the bright light of the glow lamps as they hurried about their business. The same bright light, Navit thought as he strode along, that would make the spaceport an ideal target for the warships orbiting high above them. He wondered if that same thought had occurred to the rest of the hurrying crowd. Perhaps that was one of the reasons they were hurrying. He reached the target zone and gave a soft whistle. It was answered immediately from a stack of shipping crates to his right. Stepping around the stack, he found Cliff waiting. Report, he murmured. We're set, Cliff murmured back. She went in about an hour ago and shut things down. I shorted out one of the glow lamps to give us an approach. Navit edged an eye around the crates for a cautious look. The old woman's Sidon pacifier was squatting silently in its landing circle, with nothing but parking lights showing. A long strip of shadow thrown by another stack of crates led nearly to its sealed hatchway. Looks good, he said. What about the new rep agents? Well now, that's an interesting question, Cliff said. I did a quick slice into the spaceport computer, and according to its records, they're gone. Navit frowned. Gone? Now? Where? No idea, Cliff said. But I ran a global against both the registration and the engine ID, and there's no indication they might have circled around and landed again. Not here or anywhere else on Bothawui. Interesting indeed, Navit murmured, stroking his chin as he gazed at the pacifier. Either we fooled them completely, or else they suddenly had something more urgent to do. Rogue Squadron's attached to Bella Bliss these days, isn't it? Cliff nodded. You think Bella Bliss is up to something? That walking sack of annoyance is always up to something, Navit growled. However, he's not our problem. We'll send word to Bastion and let them figure him out. Right now, he slid his blaster out of its concealed sheath. We've got our own sack of annoyance to deal with. Come on. They slipped out into the concealing shadow and headed for the pacifier, eyes and ears alert for any sign of trouble. None came before they reached the ship, dropping into combat crouches on opposite sides of the hatchway. Pop it, Navit muttered, blaster held ready as he tried to watch everywhere at once. Antilles could conceivably have sent in other new rep agents on his way out. There was the muffled clicking of Cliff's lock gems, followed by a soft hiss, and the top of the hatchway swung smoothly down to the permacrete, its inside surface forming a ramp. Giving the area one final scan, Navit rose from his crouch and ducked up the ramp into the ship. Inside was darkness, with only dim walk lights marking the corridors. He could hear Cliff's soft breathing behind him as he eased down towards the living section. Still no signs of life. The old woman must already be asleep. He eased to the first door in line, eased it open, and abruptly, all around them, the lights blazed on. Navit dropped instantly into a crouch, cursing under his breath as he blinked against the sudden glare. There was a bump against his shoulders as Cliff dropped into a mirror-image crouch at his back. No one here, Cliff hissed from behind him. Not here either, Nevitt said, frowning as his eyes finished adjusting to the light and realizing that what had seemed so bright when they came on were apparently only the normal shipboard lights. No gunmen, no automatic weapons, not even any eye-burning flash flare defensive lights. What was going on? Good evening, gentlemen, a voice spoke up into the tense silence. The old woman's voice. Cliff, Navit hissed, looking around again. There was still no one visible in his direction. Anyone? No, I'm not here, the voice assured him smugly. I'm a recording. You wouldn't hurt an innocent little recording, would you? She snorted. Of course. Considering who you are, maybe you would. There, Cliff said, pointing. Half hidden behind a cable conduit was a small data pad with a recording rod sticking out of it. You must think you're pretty hot stuff, the woman continued, strutting around in plain sight, bamboozling the bumbling Bothans. Hey, that's kind of cute. 
and in general running rings around everyone and everything. Navit stepped over to the data pad. It was jammed into the space between the conduit and the wall as if hurriedly slapped in there. On the other hand, it had been keyed to come on with the light. Well, I'm sorry to so rudely pop your bubble, she said, but you're not as smart as you think. Not nearly as smart as you think. Navit caught Cliff's eye and nodded towards the sleeping rooms. Cliff nodded back and slipped down the corridor towards the farthest one. Putting his back to the wall, Navit leveled his blaster along the corridor leading to the flight deck. This could still be nothing but a distraction. You see, I talked to a couple of friends this afternoon, the recording went on. They tell me that every time they try to get a handle on this big, loud vengeance organization that's been making so much noise, it just kind of evaporates into nothing. Kind of like the bubble I just mentioned. Nothing but hot air. Hot air blown by, dare I say it, a handful of Imperial agents. There was a flicker of movement at the corner of Navit's eye. He glanced over to see Cliff emerge from the sleeping room area and shake his head. He nodded in the direction of the cargo hold and lifted his eyebrows questioningly. So I guess that means it's down to just you folks and me, the old woman said. My new rep friends have left, which you probably already know, and the vast organization you've been pretending to be doesn't exist. So, you and me should be fun. Cliff was staring at Nabbit, a bewildered frown on his face. What in blazes is she talking about, he hissed. Is she challenging us? Navit shrugged. Oh, and help yourself to something in the galley if you want, she added. Especially whichever of you was stuck out there watching my ship today. Stakeouts can be such thirsty work. Just put everything back in the cooler when you're done, okay? Well, see you later. Which is not to say you'll see me, of course. There was a soft click and the recording stopped. This woman is nuts, Cliff declared, looking around. Does she have any idea at all who she's dealing with? I don't know, Navit said, eyeing the data pad thoughtfully. She implied she knows we're Imperials, but she never once said anything about our covers here, or whether she even knows she's talked to us. Cliff grunted. So she's fishing. She's fishing, Navit nodded. More to the point, she's fishing alone. If she had any proof or official backing, she'd have had more than just trick lights and a recording waiting here. Sounds like her plan now is simply to draw us out. So what do we do? Cliff demanded. Keep after her? Navit rubbed his chin. No, I think we'll back off, he said slowly. If she starts wandering in too close again, we can reconsider. But with Antilles and his partner gone, she's not going to be all that effective. He peered down the corridor towards the flight deck. Unless she's still in here someplace trying to get a look at us, he amended, hefting his blaster. In which case she's automatically vaped. Now you're talking, Cliff growled. Just watch it, Navit warned. She might have set up some booby traps. They were there another hour, running a fine mesh over the ship before they finally gave up and left. Only three or four times after the recording shut off did they get close enough to the comm link hidden in the data pad for Miranda to pick up with, uh, anything of what they were saying. In most of those brief snippets, they were sounding pretty irritable. Watching through her spy hole from inside the empty crate she'd set up on top of a stack of similar ones 50 meters from her ship, she watched the two of them slip out again into the bustle of activity. So she'd been right, she and Corin and Wedge. The Imperials were here, and they were planning something nasty. And they were sufficiently rattled that they were willing to risk a murder right in the middle of the spaceport. That was very interesting. And unless her ear had totally failed her, that careless and highly unprofessional conversation beside her rigged data pad had given her their identities, the earnest but stupid proprietors of the Ex Exoticalia Pet Emporium. Of course, knowing was one thing, proving was something else entirely, and for possibly the first time in her life, that vast legal gap was going to work against her. The Imperials had joined the pedestrians on one of the major walkways now, their postures and strides midway between casual and decisive. Imperial intelligence, most likely, 
or even some of the folks from the ubiquitous underhanded tricks division. Either way, definitely experts who knew what they were doing. Unfortunately, the New Republic rep in Drevstarn wouldn't be interested in any of this without proof. Neither would the Bothans. In fact, come to think of it, there were probably still a couple of warrants outstanding against her on Bothawui. That definitely let out the Bothans. The Imperials were gone now, vanished towards the western entrance and presumably out of the spaceport. Still, as Miranda had long ago learned, presumably never fed the sabak pot or took the pets for a walk. Her new playmates might just have been irritated enough by her sneaking out on them to have left a spotter behind. Opening her pocket flask, she took a sip of the tangy blue liqueur and consulted her chrono. Another two hours, maybe three, and it should be safe to move. Taking another sip, she resealed the flask and settled herself comfortably against one of the corners of the crate. It was a long time since she'd dealt with an opponent of this caliber, and as long as she was stuck in here anyway, she might as well start working on her next move. It's so good to hear your voice again, Han, Leia's voice came over the Lady Luck speaker, and there was no mistaking the relief in her tone. I've been so worried about you. Hey, Han. It was no big deal, Han assured her, only fudging the truth a little. There would be plenty of time to tell her the whole story of their little trip to Bastion when he could hold her hand while he did it. And besides, the last thing he wanted to put out on a holonet call, even an encrypted one, was the fact that Grand Admiral Thrawn was indeed still alive. The point is that we got in and out okay and we're heading home, he went on. I'm glad you're safe, she said, a cautious hope creeping into her voice. Did you... I mean, we got it, Han told her. At least, I think we got it. There was a short pause. What does that mean? It means we got what we went for, Han said. And it all looked all right to me. But, well, there were a couple of complications. Let's leave it at that for now, okay? Okay, she said reluctantly, clearly not happy about letting it go like that, but as aware as he was of the limitations of Holonet security. But don't go to Coruscant. I'm on my way to Bothawui. Bothawui? Yes, she said. I was heading for Coruscant when I found out President Gaversom was there trying to mediate this whole war fleet thing. Ah, Han said, frowning at the speaker. Considering he'd left her on Packwick Minor ten days ago, she should have already been on Coruscant, not just on her way there. Had something happened with that meeting with Bella Bliss? Your visitor get delayed or something? he asked obliquely. The visitor arrived right on schedule, she said. Only it wasn't exactly who I was expecting, and I then wound up taking a little side trip. Han felt his hands curl into fists. What kind of side trip? he demanded. If someone had tried to hurt her again. Are you all right? No, no, I'm fine, she hastened to assure him. Things just went differently than I was expecting, that's all. It's all tied in with why I have to talk to Gaversom right away. Holland had security. Yeah, all right. We'll head for Bathawui, Han said. It'll be another couple of days before we can get there. That's fine, she said. I won't be there until tomorrow myself. Han grimaced. It would have been better if he could have gotten there ahead of her. From everything he was hearing, the sky over Bothawui was a flashpoint just begging to happen. Well, you be careful, Leia, all right? I will, she promised. I'm just glad you're safe. I'll call Gaversom right away and give him the good news about your mission. And tell him I'm not going to give it to him unless he promises you some real vacation time when this is over, Han warned. Absolutely, she agreed. Okay. I love you, Leia. He could almost hear her smile. I know, she said, in their private joke. I'll see you soon. With a sigh, Han cut off the calm. Another two days to Bothawui with Leia getting there a day ahead of him. Maybe Lando could get a little more speed out of this crate. He swiveled his chair around. So how's Leia? Lando said from the bridge doorway. 
She's fine, Han assured him, studying his friend's face. There was something very unpleasant lurking there behind his eyes. Sounds like she had more than a straight run home from Packard Minor, though, and we have to change course for Bothawui to meet her. What's up? Trouble, Lando said darkly, jerking his head over his shoulder. Come on back a minute. Lobot and Mogid were waiting in the aft control room when he and Lando arrived, sitting on opposite sides of the computer table. Lobot just looked like Lobot, but Mogid's antenna were twitching in a way Han had never seen a Verpine do before. And lying on the table between them was the data card Thrawn had given them. Don't tell me, he warned as Lando picked up the data card and slid it into the computer reader. You said it was clean. We thought it was, Lando said, pulling up the Kamas document on the large plotting display. But then Mogid thought of something else to try. He pointed to the display. Turns out it's been altered. A whole string of Corellian curses ran through Han's mind. None of them was adequate for the situation. Altered how, he asked, just for the record. You have to ask? Lando growled. The list of the Bothans involved in the attack has been changed. The one thing we absolutely needed. Han stepped closer, peering at the display. You're sure, he asked, again, just for the record. Mogad is, Lando said, looking down at the Verpine. It's a masterful job, but there are some tricks the Verpines have come up with over the years. He pointed at the display. Remember how surprised we were when we first looked it over and saw how many of the top Bothan families were implicated? Well, now we know why those names are there. A little something to stir the pot a little more, Han said with a grimace, and to make the rest of the New Republic trust the Bothan leadership even less than they already do. You got it, old friend. Lando pulled out one of the other chairs and sat down. Which means we're right back at square one. Han pulled out a chair for himself. We're not even that lucky, he said glumly. I already told Leia we've got the document. You don't think she'll keep that information to herself? Normally, yes, Han said heavily. Unfortunately, she already said she was going to give Gaverson the good news. And he won't keep it to himself. Han shook his head. He's on Bothawui, trying to keep a war from starting. And he's not the type to not use every tool he's got. So in other words, we're going to show up at Bothawui with everyone expecting us to be the heroes of the day. Lando shook his head. Where's an Imperial ambush when you need one? I wouldn't joke about that if I were you, Han warned him. You can bet that Thrawn will be keeping the Empire off our backs on this one. But there are a lot of people on our side who won't want to see the Bothans getting the chance to slip off the hook. Lando winced. I hadn't thought about that. Though come to think of it. No. What? I was just thinking about what Thrawn said about Failure's people stealing those Zeril sniper blasters, he said slowly. But if he was lying about the Kamas document... It doesn't necessarily mean he was lying about that too, Han said. For that matter, we don't have any proof that Thrawn was even the one who changed those names. Lando snorted. You don't really believe that, do you? Someone's going to bring it up, Han pointed out. I can guarantee that one. Lando muttered something under his breath. This just gets messier and messier. So what do we do? Han shrugged. We go to Bothawui on schedule and pretend nothing is wrong. Maybe the Bothans really do know who was involved. If they do, maybe we can bluff them into coming clean. And if they don't, or we can't? Han got to his feet. We've got two days to come up with something else. Come on. Let's go turn this crate towards Bothawui. That's it, Tears said with grim satisfaction, waving at the display. They've come. I'm not convinced, Disra growled, peering at the computer-enhanced image on the display. Fine. So whoever they are seem to be using TIE Fighter technology. That doesn't prove a thing. They flew past Bastion, Tears pointed out, clearly looking us over. 
and we've never seen anything like this anywhere else. That doesn't even prove it was from the unknown regions, Disra sniffed, let alone that it was Park at the hand of Thrawn or whoever. And Bastion is where Thrawn was last reported being seen, Tears finished with a note of finality in his voice. Doubt all you like, Your Excellency, but I can tell you right now that the scheme has worked. Thrawn's old allies are finally nosing around the bait. I hope you're right, Disra said. With the Bathawui flash postponed, and with Pelion probably springing verbal from Rimsey Station right at this moment. I told you not to worry about that, Tears said with some asperity. There's no way he can hurt us. Who can't hurt us? Flim's voice asked from off to the left. Disra turned to see Flim emerge from the secret door. The con man had been doing a lot of that lately, he'd noticed, skulking around quietly, eavesdropping on his two partners, as if he didn't trust them. Admiral Pelion, Tears told him. We were just speculating that he and Colonel Vermel will probably be coming by at some point to demand an explanation for how we've been mistreating them. And you were also speculating about that alien ship that buzzed past Bastion a couple of days ago, Flim demanded. Or were you going to wait until the Hand of Thrawn knocked on the palace gate before you mentioned it? I can assure you that the first thing they will not uh, uh, they do will not be to show up here in person, Tyr said. These are very cagey people, Admiral, which, considering the card they're holding, they have every right to be. No, their first contact will be a cautious transmission from somewhere in deep space, where they can make a fast escape if they decide it's necessary. I fail to see how that helps us any, Flim said icily. One way or the other, they're still going to want to talk to Thrawn. Of course they are, Tears explained patiently. But calling in from off-planet allows me to take a message for you and to shake some useful information out of them along the way. Trust me, Admiral. I've been planning for this moment for a long time. Flim grimaced. That's going to be very comforting if Park sees straight through it and blasts Bastion to rubble. Tears shook his head. These people were extremely loyal to Thrawn, Admiral, he said. No matter how cautious and skeptical they appear on the surface, they want Thrawn to have survived Bill Bringy. You're a con man. Surely you understand the effect wishful thinking has on a target. Oh, it's very useful, Flynn grumbled. It also means they're twice as dangerous when you finally pull the rug out from under them. Speaking of dangerous, did either of you know that General Bella Bliss has disappeared? Tears and Disra exchanged glances. What are you talking about? Disra asked. We got a message from the strike team on Bathawui a couple of hours ago, Flim said, strolling forward and tossing a data card onto the desk. He said a couple of Rogue Squadron pilots who'd been sniffing around had suddenly pulled out and left the system. He suggested that might mean Bella Bliss was up to something. Could be, Tears nodded, stepping to the desk and picking up the data card. Let me check on it. I already did, Flim said, pulling over a chair and sitting down. The official story is that Bella Bliss is out at Cothless putting together a new Republic force to protect Bathawui. But if you start poking through the data, you can't find any evidence that he's anywhere near Botham's space. How did you learn about all this? Disra interrupted. Flim lifted his eyebrows in polite surprise. I'm Grand Admiral Thrawn, Your Excellency, he reminded him. I called intelligence and asked. Did you get a written report? Tears asked him. He had the data card on his data pad now and was skimming through it. It's at the end of the record, Flynn told him. They were quite helpful, actually. Asked me if I'd like someone to do a flyby around Cothless and see what they could find out. Waste of time, Tears said, his voice starting to sound a little odd. If Cothless is a cover story, Bella Bliss will have made it far too vactite for any casual flyby to pick up on. That's exactly what I told them, Flynn said smugly. I'm starting to pick up a genuine feel for tactics, if I do say so myself. Don't flatter yourself, Tears said absently, gazing at the data pad. And in the future, kindly do not interact with anyone without Moff Disra or myself present. Now be quiet and let me think. Disra watched the guardsman's face, an unpleasant sensation creeping over him. 
Jerish seem to be doing more and more of this sort of thing lately. This staring off into space as if in some kind of trance, as he thought. Was the pressure and strain starting to get to him? Or had he always been this way and Disra simply hadn't noticed? Abruptly, Tirsa's head snapped up. Admiral, you said that the Dulin woman had been called uh, had called one of the Mistral leaders to come talk with us? Yes, Flim said. Last I heard, she was on her way here. Have Dulin get in touch with her and tell her to change course, Tirsa instructed him. Tell her we'll meet with her instead at Yaga Minor. Yaga Minor, Disra repeated, frowning. Yes, Tyr said, smiling tightly. I believe we may be able to give the Mistral a live demonstration of Thrawn's tactical genius, and help convince Captain Park that Thrawn is indeed back, and deliver a humiliating blow to one of Coruscant's best and brightest in the bargain. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Disra protested. You've lost me. I think he's trying to tell us Bella Bliss is going to be insane enough to hit Yaga Minor, Flim said, staring in obvious disbelief at tears. The guardsman inclined his head slightly. Very good, Admiral. Only it's not insane. It's their very last chance to avert a civil war. Who better to send than Bella Bliss? I think Flim was right the first time, Disra said. You're talking about the Kamas document. But they've already got the copy we gave Solo and Calrissian. But Bella Bliss doesn't know about that. Tears tapped the data pad. According to the report, he vanished to the supposed Cothless buildup eight days before that traitor Carib Devist brought his falsified data to the Parshuni Abiturate Station, which was how Solo found Bastion. Assuming Bella Bliss has been basically out of contact with Coruscant, and that's the likely situation, he won't know anything about Solo's bastion trip. And what if he checks in before he leaves for the attack and they tell him to stand down, Disra countered. Then we simply impress the Mistral with the size and power of an Imperial Ubiquitrate base, Tears said. They don't need to know we're expecting an attack until it actually happens. He looked at Flim. It's a classic con technique, he added. If the target doesn't know what's supposed to happen, he can't be disappointed if it doesn't. He's right about that, Flynn agreed. All right, fine, Disra said. And what if Coruscant changes its mind and sends Bella Bliss to attack Bastion instead? Tyr shrugged. On what grounds? We've given them the Kamas document. Altered. Which they don't know about and have no way of proving, Tyrs reminded him. The point is that if Bella Bliss so much as pokes his nose into this system, They'll be handing us a propaganda weapon they'll regret for years to come. Give me some hollows of an unprovoked New Republic attack on Bastion, and I'll have a thousand systems seceding from Coruscant in the first month alone. Besides, Your Excellency, Flim said with a casual wave of his hand, even if Bella Bliss did hit Bastion, the three of us will still be safe at Yaga Minor. Unless you're so attached to your comforts here, you couldn't bear to give them up. I was merely pointing out, Disra said stiffly, that it would look bad for Thrawn to be somewhere else when the Imperial capital was under attack. Don't worry about it, Tyr said, with a tone of finality in his voice. Bella Bliss won't hit Bastion, and he will hit Yaga Minor. And once we've defeated him, we'll see the Empire's prestige rise considerably. We might also finally push Coruscant into launching a full-scale attack at us, Disra warned. Tyr shook his head. In five days, Coruscant will have a civil war on its hands, he said. And long before they're ready to turn any attention this direction, we'll have Park and the Hand of Thrawn. His eyes glittered. And this time, there will be nothing that can stop us. Nothing at all. The corridor was long and drab and gray, lined with equally drab doors. Locked doors, of course. This was a prison, after all. The walls and ceiling were solid metal, the floor a metal grating that gave off a pair of hollow-sounding clinks with every footstep. They were certainly making a lot of those clinks at the moment, Pelion thought, listening to the sound echo off the walls as he strode down the corridor towards the secondary security post just around the corner at the far end. It sounded like a parade, in fact, or a sudden burst of rain on a thin metal roof. 
and those ahead had taken notice of the commotion. Already four of the guards had poked black-helmeted heads around the corner to see what all the commotion was about. Two of those guards were still visible. The others had ducked back out of sight, presumably to report whoever was manning the security post. The other two guards had reappeared by the time Pelion reached the corner, all four of them now standing stiffly at full military attention. Without a word or glance, Pelion passed through the group and rounded the corner. Four more guards were standing at attention behind the security post desk, three meters in front of an extra secure-looking cell door. Seated at the desk, gazing up at Pelion with a mixture of uncertainty and surliness in his face, was a young major. He opened his mouth to speak. I'm Admiral Pelion, Pelion cut him off. Supreme Commander of the Imperial Fleet. Open the door. The major's cheek twitched. I'm sorry, Admiral, but I have orders that the prisoner is to be kept strictly incommunicado. For a few seconds, Pelion just stared at him. A glare developed and honed and fine-tuned by long decades of Imperial command. I'm Admiral Pelion, he said at last, biting out each word, his tone the verbal counterpart of that blade-edged glare. He'd been willing to give the guards the benefit of the doubt, but he had neither the time nor the inclination to put up with any nonsense whatsoever. Supreme Commander of the Imperial Fleet, open the door. The Major swallowed visibly. His eyes flicked away from Pelion to the dozen stormtroopers visible in the corridor behind him, his mind perhaps flicking to the other twelve stormtroopers out of sight around the corner that his guards would have told him about, then came reluctantly back to Pelion's face again. My orders come from Mos D Moff Dissera himself, sir, he said, the words coming out with difficulty. Beside Pelion, the stormtrooper commander stirred. Moff Disra is a civilian, Pelion reminded the Major, giving him one last chance. And I'm countermanding those orders. The Major took a careful breath. Yes, sir, he said, capitulating at last. Half turning, he nodded to one of the guards. The guard, who had also been eyeing the stormtroopers and had obviously already done the math, showed no hesitation whatsoever. Stepping quickly to the cell door behind him, he keyed it open and moved smartly aside. Wait here, Pelion told the stormtrooper commander, rounding the desk and stepping into the cell, his pulse pounding in his neck. If Disra had somehow managed to get word here through the transmission blockade and ordered all witnesses disposed of... Seated at a small table, a hand of single sabacc laid out in front of him, Colonel Vermel looked up, his eyes widening in astonishment. Admiral, he said, clearly not sure he believed it. I... Abruptly, he scrambled to his feet. Colonel Mize Vermel, Admiral, he said briskly, request permission to return to duty, sir. Request granted, Colonel, Pelion said, not bothering to hide his relief. And may I say how pleased I am to find you looking so well. Thank you, Admiral, Vermel said, heaving a sigh of relief of his own as he stepped around the table. I hope you didn't come alone. Don't worry, Pelion assured him grimly, waving Vermel to the cell door. I haven't exactly taken over Rimsey Station, but my men are in position to do so if any of Disra's people take exception to our leaving. Yes, sir, Vermel said, throwing an odd look back at him. Regardless, may I suggest hurry? My sentiments exactly, Pelion agreed, frowning. There had been something in that look. They passed the Major and the guard station without comment and headed around the corner. The stormtroopers, as per Pelion's earlier instructions, fell into full escort array with twelve each front and rear. You didn't sound very confident when I mentioned Isra's people a minute ago, Pelion commented as they headed down the long corridor. It may not be Disra's authority. You'll have to go up against Admiral, Vermel said, moving a bit closer to Pelion as if worried about being overheard. When Captain Dorsha brought me aboard after intercepting my ship at Morishim, he said he'd been personally ordered to do so by Grand Admiral Thrawn. Pelion felt his throat tighten. Thrawn. Yes, sir, Vermel said. I've been hoping it was just some trick of Disra's. I remember you mentioning how totally against these peace talks he was. But Dorja seems so sure. Yes, Pelion murmured. 
I've heard some of those rumors myself. He's allegedly been seen by various people in the New Republic, too. Vermal was silent a moment. But you haven't actually seen him yourself. No. Pelly embraced himself. But I think it's time I did, he said. If he has indeed returned. You might be in trouble with him for pulling me out, Vermal pointed out reluctantly, glancing back over his shoulder. Perhaps it would be better if I went back. No, Pelian said firmly. Thrawn never punished his officers for doing what they sincerely thought was right, especially when he hadn't given the motors or the necessary information to understand otherwise. They reached the end of the corridor and turned into the main guard nexus. The guards and officers were still sitting where Pelion had left them, glowering under the silently watchful eye of yet another contingent of the Chimera's stormtroopers. No, we're going to go back to Bastion and see what Moff Disra has to say about all this, he continued, as they passed through the Nexus and headed towards the landing bay where their shuttles were berthed. If the rumors are false, then we should have no further trouble with Moff Disra. Commander Dreyf and I have obtained a set of data cards, in Disra's personal encrypt, no less, that lays out his entire operation. Names, places, and deals, including all his links to the Kavril who pirates and various shady financiers on both sides of the border. He felt his face harden. And including the details of his efforts to incite civil war within the New Republic. That alone should be worth a great deal to us in any future negotiations with Coruscant. It will certainly put Disra away for a long time. Yes, sir, Vermal murmured. And if the rumors are true? Pelion swallowed. If the rumors are true, we'll deal with them then. Vermal nodded. Yes, sir. In the meantime, Pelion went on conversationally. Your last report is far overdue. I'd like to hear exactly what happened at Morishim. And that's the end of the chapter. Hope you enjoyed it. Talk to you soon.